Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our holiday special of Adoption Happy Hour, brought to you by NAP. We are the National Association of Adoptees and Parents, where it is our mission to unify the adoption community and elevate our diverse voices by promoting dialogue, understanding, and healing through education, awareness, and connections. I'm Marcy Keithley, board president and your host for this evening, along with fellow board members, Beth Story and Jennifer Falsing. Uh, any, do you have any other board members here this evening? Uh, okay. All right. If you haven't already, please feel free to join in the, uh, the chat room and let uh, Dr. Abby know where you're, where, where you're from this evening and say hello to others. We appreciate everybody joining us tonight. We know this is right before Christmas and we appreciate you taking your time to join us tonight. Uh, we've got a couple of housekeeping items, so we'll start with whoever has the stuff for me. Okay, this is a reminder, this is a public meeting with no guarantee that information or identi identity is confidential. Portions of this event are recorded and may be shared on our private happy hour group on Facebook and on our YouTube channel. If you're not following us on Facebook, please do so. That's where we go ahead and uh, list all the replays. Please remain on mute, raise your hand or screen or the virtual hand to be recognized. You're welcome to post your questions or comments in the chat while our spotlight guest is speaking. If you are experiencing a serious mental health event or suicidal thought, please contact a licensed professional or the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 988. Okay, what else do we have? Well, I think we want to talk about the gift certificates that we're doing uh, right now. So for those of you who haven't done your shopping, we do have um, the ability now to do gift certificates for the Untangling Our Roots Summit. That is March 30th to April 1st. And it is at that special introductory rate. We have just a few gift certificates available at that rate. Um, and when you do register, you have to... to pick your courses. So if you're giving it as a gift certificate, they'll, they'll be going in and doing that. You don't have to do that for them, but it's a great gift idea for that hard to buy for adoptee, NPE, donor conceived person, or mom. <laughs> so um, that is available and you go to untanglingourroots.org. And then I guess we can go ahead and share our upcoming dates. Let me see here if I have that. Um, I don't know. Do you know the date off the top of your head? Dr. Um, 27. Joyce, Joyce has got um, last program for this year. Um, putting yourself together after a reunion on December 27th. It's at 6 p.m. That is a Tuesday. And David Bull also has Adoptee Pass to Recovery, same day, the 27th, but it is at 8.30 Eastern time. And then Danielle Gaudette has um, Self-Love Essentials for the Adoption Constellation. This is our newest program. And the date on that, Marcy, do you have that off the top of your head? Uh, that one I don't know off the top of my head. It is still December because I set it up. I think it's the 29th, maybe. Yeah, the 29th. And that's uh, at 7.30 p.m. Eastern time. That is everything. That's everything. Okay. All right. Well, we'd like to welcome Dr. Abby Hasbury to Adoption Happy Hour this evening. Abby, it's really good to have you tonight and see you. So Thank we're going to, I want to share a little bit with uh, our attendees a little bit about you before we begin. Uh, Dr. Abigail Hasbury currently resides in both San Antonio, San Antonio, Texas and Baltimore, Maryland, and is married with three children. She is a licensed marriage and family therapist associate. She holds a BS in African American studies and sociology, an MA in teaching, K through 12, a PhD in curriculum and, in, curriculum and instruction, a school superintendent certification, and an MED in counseling and development, marriage and family counseling. She is a former teacher and principal with experience in private, traditional public and charter schools. 
Abby is a domestic transracial adoptee in reunion who was adopted as an infant and as the youngest child in a family with three biological children, making her not only the only adoptee, but also the only African-American in her family. In addition, she is a birth mom in reunion with her son, and she is publishing her memoir that will be coming out in 2023 called Adopting Privilege. Welcome, Abby. Thank How you. are you? Doing well, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's good to have you back on Happy Hour. Yes, good to be here. It's been way too long, so thank you yes. for, for having yes. me. So um, before we get started, I just kind of wanna just call out that some of this stuff is hard to talk about and may just bring up things and anyone feel free to go off camera if you need to, feel free to take a break, do any of the things that you need to do, give yourself permission to take care of yourself as needed. Um, the one thing I do request is that we accept that others are in different spaces and different places in their journey and have many different perspectives. And so we respect each other's perspectives and we assume that everyone has good intent when they come into this space. And so sometimes our words are not always the most eloquent or the most politically correct or whatever those things may be, but just know that the intent behind the words um, are coming from, from good places with people. Um, so thank you for all of that. So um, Marcy said a little bit about me, but I just kind of want to just throw out my identifiers. I identify as an infant domestic transracially adopted person, um, and I, I identify as someone who was adopted during the baby scoop era. I also identify as a birth mother who was the victim of adoption coercion, and so that's part of my, my makeup and, and, and part of who I am. Um, I, as Marcy mentioned, I have three children, 27, 20, and 16, and former educator, current leadership coach and startup coach for entrepreneurs and a marriage and family therapist. I consider myself to be a, an, and a speaker and I guess I, I consider myself to have an expertise, although I don't think anyone is ever an expert in anything, we're always learning and developing, um, but in identity development, processing trauma, understanding anxiety and development. And so my goal is to use my experience to help others feel confident and comfortable being themselves. And I hope one day, like my biggest goal in life, other than the memoir, but my biggest goal in life, and I don't even know why this is a thing because I really don't like speaking publicly, but my biggest goal in life is to be on, big, on the big stage and do a TED talk. So um, thank you for being part of my journey to get there. So you all are part of that, that journey to my end goal. Um, and so I'm here to talk a little bit about the holidays and just to share with you some of the things that I do, do personally to get through holidays and reunion, but also the things that I work through with my um, clients to help them prepare for the, the holidays. Um, the holidays can be hard. I love the holidays, but I know that they can be hard. Part of me loving the holidays is, is knowing what boundaries I can have. And Jennifer was talking earlier about, earlier about how she has many people coming from the holidays I have protected my space around the holidays and for the past 20 years have said that the holidays will only be for me and my kids. And that's just, just the Christmas holiday time I've asked and respected, my, my parents and family have respected that that time is something that I say for me and myself and my kids only. Um, and part of that is, is because of the stresses in the holiday, during the holiday time. Um, the APA has a study that said 30% of the general population reports an increased stress during the holidays. And people with mental health concerns, 64% of them report an increased stress during the holidays. And there are lots of reasons that we can think about that that may be. Um, you think about like the mad rush up to the holiday season at work. It's the end of the year. We're doing all the end of the year reports or closing out business. Kids are finishing finals right before the holidays. So it's that kind of frenzy of activity up until the holidays. On top of that, there's shorter days with dark nights and, and winter and gloomy weather, not being able to get out and do the things that we normal, normally do, not being able to, to get out and see the sun and, and get the vitamin D that we normally need. Um, there's travel plans and there's anxiety around that, whether it's just making the plans, um, we think about just getting out of our comfort zone and staying in other places, or we think about the anxiety of hosting and, and kind of that performance nature of the holidays. We can also think about um, just traveling in general makes, often makes people um, anxious. We're thinking about like airplane travel, driving, all of those things bring around a little bit of, of anxiety. Then I mentioned the performance aspect of it. 
holidays bring about expectations and we feel like we have to meet those expectations. My biggest memory in the holiday time is around my mother, almost every single holiday, Thanksgiving, Christmas, whatever it was, having some sort of breakdown because someone didn't like their present that she thought so hard on or food was burnt or she forgot something or one little thing would set her off every single year. And that's one of the things that I just remember as like a childhood memory is that every year on the holidays, that performance, performative aspect of the holiday always brought my mother in such an extreme um, anxiety and stress that she would have some sort of melt out and end up going into another room to kind of just recoup and, and just regenerate her feelings. So if you think about all of those things just with a normal holiday, we throw in adoption into that. We throw in adoptive families, we throw in birth families, we throw in reunion, not being in reunion. All of those things end up making it an even more stressful time. For me, thinking about adoptive families, I think about going back to my family and, and code switching. And by that, I mean that the person that I am with my family, my family unit, my children, um, me being an African-American, my, my husband's African-American, my kids are, there's a way I am within my family that I am not when I'm with my adoptive family. And so going back to my adoptive family also brings changes in the way that I present um, myself um, and stress around that code sw switching and the expectations of who they thought I was or think that I am, that I'm not necessarily to my core. I also think about the fact that now that I am in reunion, there's that shame or guilt of reconnecting with my adoptive family and with my biological family, I'm sorry. And thinking about like what that means to my adoptive parents is also a stressor. How much time can I spend with my biological family? Do I talk to my adoptive family about it? All of those stressors are part of it too. Um, and in conversations with my birth family who I reconnected with in 2017, that first holiday was that I, I met them in person in August and at Thanksgiving, they were on Facebook posting pictures of, of each other together for the holiday and no one invited me. And I remember having a conversation, an awkward conversation with them about like, when is it okay to start thinking about spending any time together on the holidays as a biological family? Um, am I invited? Should I invite them? If they invite me, is it okay for me to say no, that I'm not ready? All of those things. Um, are a stressor. And when I am with them on holidays or any time really, it's, there's always a feeling of um, sort of misconnections, the inside jokes, the family traditions and history that I should have been part of that I'm not. Um, and that kind of, you had to be there kind of feeling. That's another stressor that definitely happens around those holidays and getting together in reunion. And then there are those of us who aren't in reunion and that lost family and questioning and having that longing, the wondering if they're thinking about you on the day, if they have a stocking for your initial, like, do they consider you? Do they talk about you? All of those things are also really stressful and cause a lot of those stressors. So if you think about that, 38% of the general population has increased stress and 64% of those with mental health crisis have increased stress. I would say it's probably much higher than that within the adoptee um, community of having a much higher stress around the holidays and reunion. So for biological families, birth families, one of the questions that my sister asked me one year was like, how should I incorporate you? Do you wanna be invited? Do you not wanna be invited? Um, if I bring you, if we bring you in, are there traditions that you want to bring? And it was probably the most like freeing, authentic conversation that we could have had. Um, I was able to tell her like what my expectations were, what I felt comfortable, what I didn't feel comfortable with. Um, and I just, it was a gift that she gave me to say, let's have a conversation about it. Because that first Thanksgiving, I really sat there and just scrolled through and watched them all getting together and wondered why I hadn't been invited. And so had I not reached out to her and say, you know, I was feeling kind of some kind of way about those posts. Um, then she opened up and said, what should I have done? Like, let me know, we weren't sure what, what we should have done either. So open communication, always, always 100%. When I have spent time with my biological family, I've hesitated to share that with my adoptive family as well. And so there's also that open communication. Um, 
asking my adoptive parents, what do you want me to do? Like, do you want to know that this is happening or not? Um, it's something that I, I tried to do in the beginning. Um, my mother, though, has dementia, so it hasn't been a conversation that we've been able to really have. And she, her, her struggle with dementia started before I went in reunion. But I have had that conversation with my adoptive siblings who all want to know. They said, yes, we want to know, we want to share, we want to know everything that you're doing. Um, that has been really freeing to be able to say too, like, what do you guys want to know? What do you not want to know? How are you feeling about it? It really, really has been tough. But I think that the toughest part of re being in reunion in the holidays has been around my being my role as a birth parent and not knowing what to do with my biological son, whether to invite him or not, how do I send cards, what do I do? And it's interesting because he actually lived with us for about a year and a half. And during that time we did holidays together and he saw what our traditions are. Um, and when I think about it now that that is enough for me, he knows what we do, he knows we would include him. We are now not doing holidays together. He is taking a step back and is kind of working through his own feelings about adoption and his adoption and his relationship with me. And we've had been able to communicate that as well. It's been really hard though to communicate that to, his, to my kids, his siblings, especially my youngest daughter who's 16, but was four when she met him. So she doesn't know a time that he wasn't her brother. And so not knowing how to communicate to her that this is, you know, this is his path. This is something he's not rejecting us. He's working through his own stuff. So as a mother trying to work through my feelings about it and also trying to protect his relationship with her and also trying to give voice and give um, affirm her feelings about the feeling of rejection from him and the fact that he doesn't want to come through. That's, that has definitely been the most stressful part of, of being in reunion in the holidays is, is my role as a birth mother. I suggest is boundaries. I am a huge boundary person. Boundaries for self care. They provide self care for me in that I control access for who I want to be involved in my life at any certain time and not. And so even before being in reunion 20 years ago, I decided as a brand new wife and, and mother that holidays were super important to me. How I love Christmas, I love Christmas traditions, if they are really important to me. And so I decided that one of the things that I was going to do was to ask my family not to come to our house during Christmas, just during that on that day. Um, because of the performative nature of it, because hosting just gives me high anxiety because I want to make sure everyone's happy and everything, everyone's right. And probably just from my adopted mother, just pass that down to me. Um, and I wanted to save a space for my kids where the memories were all around comfort and love and joy and nurturing. And so Christmas morning is just with my kids, grandkids now also, but just with my family. And that's a boundary that I've set up and we will see our, my family, biological or adoptive, either on Christmas Eve or Christmas night for dinner. But that Christmas morning time is a space that I've reserved just for me and my, my kids as part of that boundary. I've also really looked at um, buffers. So I 100% I believe in buffers. And um, I, I married a man who is an extreme ext extrovert and loves people. And he is my buffer. And that's something I've communicated him is, you know, when I'm feeling uncomfortable, I'm going to need you to kind of be my person in between whatever's going on, whatever interaction is. And so that's something we talk about ahead of time. Um, I also do time limits. So if I'm going to a place, to someone's house, to my in-laws in -laws house, I will say, I'll, you know, I'll be there between two, from two to six. And I really set those time limits around what it is that I can handle. Um, really with my, in reunion with my biological family, I can do four hours usually at the most before I start to feel a little bit overwhelmed and start to really need to go back to a space where I can kind of regroup and see them another time. So setting time limits, limits is another one, but just communication. I can't say that enough. Communication and planning and centering your feelings and understanding and giving validity to your feelings and not say, telling yourself all the negative things that we tell ourselves, like you should be able to handle this, this is family, but giving life to those feelings and saying like, I am uncomfortable and that's okay. And these are the ways I'm gonna protect myself. Um, therapy, for sure, <laughs> let's all talk about 
therapy. I think everyone should be in therapy, um, therapy, therapy, therapy. Just having a place where you can talk to someone who understands, who is there to listen to just to you and who has no kind of skin in the game. They don't have any, any kind of, they have no positive or negative feelings about it. They're just there to listen and help you process. That is really important because that helps you then develop those boundaries, develop that plan. Um, and one of the things that I really love doing too is, is when I'm in situations in reunion, is doing taking care of myself and really doing some body scanning. And so I, I scan my body. And say, we're tense, I'm really calm right now. And I find those calm, neutral spots in my body and I focus on them. And that usually also really helps me to center myself and calm down and really enjoy the, the environment. Um, but it's tough, it's tough. Uh, so I wanted to kind of just throw out kind of my thoughts about all of this and then open up to you and have you all ask questions and share and let's talk about the holidays and the things that we're looking forward to and all of the, also the things that are challenging, especially being in reunion or thinking about reunion if you are not yet. So this is your time. I'd love to hear from you. Okay, do we have someone who would like to ask a question or comment? Who's going to start out? Catherine? Go ahead. Um, my daughter and I are, are uh, we haven't met, but we communicated over email. We live on opposite sides of the country. She, a couple of years ago, actually um, started to pull back. And now I don't hear from her at all. And um, I really just became active in adoption sites and, and uh, groups like this since last summer, I guess, when my book came out and I started seeking people like me. Um, and I've learned a lot about uh life from the adoptee side, which I had nothing. No, only my own perceptions before that. I had, I had nothing. Um, I know other times in this group, I've been, it's been suggested that I keep the lines of communication open with her. Um, I guess my question is, I'm sitting here listening to you and I'm thinking, so I don't even know now if I have her right email I, um, or her right number because I sent her a text over Thanksgiving and said, I'm just wondering if, if you're getting, if, you're, if, your message, if your contact information has changed. Um, you know, and I said, happy Thanksgiving. I didn't hear anything. So I don't know if I should, and I don't, she sent me a happy birthday on my birthday in July. Um, and I wrote back and said, thank you and asked her how she was doing and she didn't write back. So I don't know if I should send her a, a Merry Christmas and I hope all is well. Should I send her an email and say, I've learned a lot and I understand that you will come to me when and if you're ready. Um, or should I just leave her alone? Yeah. So trying to decide which hat to answer this from, the adoption <laughs> hat or the, or the birth mom hat. I'm going to answer from both. So from the birth mom hat, I would say that our job as birth moms, as moms in general, um, is to just love our kids and be there, there for them when they need us. And so leaving that line of communication open means just that you're leaving your heart open for when she wants to come. Um, from the adoptee perspective, I think that sending a message saying Merry Christmas, um, that's it, thinking about you today is enough, as long as the message is for her and not for you. And what I mean by that is by you just expressing your love to her, but not expecting anything back or asking any questions. I think that that sounds like the thing that 
as an okay. adoptee, that was, is what I would want or need. Um, and as a birth mom, that's the thing that I would want to give. Okay. That's very helpful because I do always ask for something. <laughs> I, <do. laughs> I also say I would love to hear from you or I would love to meet you or um, yeah. at Thanksgiving, I said, I'm getting older <laughs> and she has three daughters who I've not, I don't know, you know, I'm getting older. They're getting older. I would love to meet you. And uh, so, yes, I, I, I do ask for something. Yeah. Um, I think that why I'm saying not ask for something is one, it does put a little pressure on her to respond or not, or to, to like, to not, and then make you feel bad. And it also sets you up for a possibility of not feeling good. So it's not just for her, but also for you. If you don't ask for something, then you're not hurt when she doesn't respond. It's just giving yeah. her that love and that space to say, I'm here. Um, and then you can just close that and walk away and you're okay if she doesn't respond. But yeah. if you ask a question or leave it open like that, then you're checking the email and I, I've been there. So <laughs> I've been there with, with, my, with my son. Um, checking to see if they, if they responded and waiting and all of that, but just for your own heart, just pour out to her and just cut it right there and, and let that be enough. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for your, your honesty and your vulnerability too. Thanks, Catherine. Who would like to go next? Somebody have a question or a comment? While people are deciding, I will tell Abby. Okay, so out of those 22 people that are coming to my house for Christmas, one of them is my biological mother and her husband. Today is our nine year anniversary of being in reunion. And my son that I lost to adoption and his family and his grown son and his family. So, and we've also been in reunion for nine years. I found my son and then two months later, I found my mother. So we have just, it's like more family to love, just pile on in and you know, I, that's what I love about the holidays. My stepdad, my, my bio, adoptive mother has been gone for 13 years. Her husband is gonna stop by with his new wife, you know, wow. and he's 94 years old, he'll come by. So, I mean, I think that's cool. And I think maybe being a child of, um, parents that got divorced and remarried and blended families over and over again that to me this is just like no big deal come on in be a part of the crowd <laughs> whereas I'm like yeah. <laughs> 22 people <laughs> just all I ever wanted was family now I've got it so I can't freak out yes no that definitely freaks me out but it, it, it also warms my heart to hear you say it um, yeah. but definitely freaks me out but I'm also the person who when I found out that I had seven siblings on my paternal side just was like wait I thought I had one brother on my mother's side I don't even know what to do with all of these people and so I ended up using the app glide like Marco Polo and just recording my video once to explain who I was and invite them all to see it so I only had to say it once so that's, that's a good idea that's also me so <laughs> Yeah, because I found a lot of siblings too. So yeah, that would have been a great idea. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. Marcy, are there comments in the chat also? Yes, let's take a look here. Um, yeah, anybody that did make comments in the chat that would like to take themselves off a of mute and go ahead and share. Hi, this is Linda. I have a question, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, thank you for being here tonight. So my question is, um, as a first mother, meaning you, how, and I'm a first mother also in reunion, a long-term reunion, how is your relationship with um, the adopted mom? With my son's adopted mom? Yes. So that is, that's a difficult question. Um, that is a hard question. Yeah. <laughs> Um, she, so she actually knew who I was from the beginning because some paperwork was not signed or by her. And so she went, she went to go back and sign paperwork when my son was a year old, I had already signed it. And so she saw my name. So she followed me, um, through high school. I was in high school when I had him and I ran track and she saw my accomplishments, accomplishments and ran track in college. And she followed me until then, until after she lost me after college. So 
she was very open to me um, and really wanting to get to know me and thank me for allowing her to raise my son. Um, she sent me a huge stack of photos of him growing up through over the years. And I think that I, I'm the one who not think that I'm the one who's backed away and has been uncomfortable. I definitely had resentment and jealousy over the fact that she got to see this kid. Um, I, I've told over the time in these stories that one of the things that I know, the only thing that I know about me to be really true is that I'm an exceptional parent. Like I just, I am a great mom. I love my children. I love mothering. And so the fact that she was able to raise and mother this kid who was mine, I, I haven't gotten over that. Um, and so I, while she has reached out to me many, many times, it's been really hard for me to accept what she's given to me. So um, I, she friended me on Facebook. At one point, I unfriended her because I just couldn't see it. And I have not accepted the request since it just sits there. It's been years and it's just sitting there with her requesting me. Occasionally, she'll reach out to my husband to see how I am. Um, and I just, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a me issue. It's 100% a me yeah. issue. Well, that's very honest. Have you talked to her about that? Um, I've talked to her about it once when she sent the pictures and I told her, you know, thank you. No, I haven't. She's like, have you looked at them? And I was like, no, I, I haven't been able to look at them because I just have all of these feelings. Um, but yeah. that was like 2012, maybe. So it's been 10 years since I've really had that kind of conversation with her. Gotcha. Well, thank you for that. And um, I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Okay. Anybody want to raise their virtual hand? Take themselves off mute. Any questions? I know I, I personally struggle every year at, at this time. I, out of the 14 years I've been in reunion with my daughter, I've had Christmas with her twice. And she always says that she wants to come and then she's always a no-show. However, um, my two grandchildren, one of which I have a legal guardianship over, I have them every year. So I guess, you know, when it comes to reunion, there's no rule book and there's no guideline. And it's just, you know, what we can each handle and what we each want. And so I'm just thankful for that, that I have the girls every year. And I see Katie's 24 and Alyssa's 16, so. Yeah, and I'm, I'm definitely thankful for the knowledge of, of who I am and who my son is, even when I'm not able to spend time. And in my reunion with, as an adoptee with my biological mother, she does not want to meet me um, and has kind of, re has rejected me again. Um, and I, even in that, I'm still glad to know who she is and be able to see pictures and know who my aunts and uncles are and my nieces and nephews. And though I don't have a relationship with them, I think it's easier around this, this time, especially to at least have information um, if, if not connection, it was much harder growing up, not knowing and wondering if they were thinking about me and, and thinking about them and wondering, you know, what foods do they eat and what do they do and all of that. And so having information and at least having that window um, to know a little bit about them and what they're doing has, that's just been invaluable for me as an adoptee. Linda? Yes. Hi. We got, too oh, many sorry. Lindas. we got too many Lindas here. <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. First of all, Dr. I that Abby, I just want to say, this is the second time I've heard you speak. I heard you speak with uh, the Cleveland group and um, you're so eloquent with, with both sides of the, the picture. And, and I really, really appreciate what you just said about your relationship with your son's adopter. And that was the most real, honest, that was beautiful because I'm there with you, sweetheart. I am so there with you. I am a first mother, a birth mother as well. I'm sitting next to my daughter. Um, um, and I just wanted to share this with the community. Um, so Louise and I have been in reunion for um, 2018. since 2018. 
and um, been a lot of problems with the kept children. And um, this past Thanksgiving, I, I just, you know, I moved from where I was in Michigan to, to Pennsylvania to be near my daughter. And um, I, I have a very good relationship with the children that I raised. And I told them that I would no longer come for holidays without my daughter that we lost to adoption. Because I made some boundaries and I said, she is my daughter, she is your sister. That, that it, my problem is my, my eldest daughter from her. It's like actually she's the middle, but she was the eldest. And she finally has come around. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we're still not there. She still said, oh, but on the day it's so, and I said, okay, I can just that you said that we can be together as a family has lifted my heart and lifted my future. So we are going to be getting together, my three children and myself um, for over the holidays. And it is a great, so it is very great. And it is through all of my time with therapy and talking to NAP and, and Adoption Network Cleveland, and we're getting there. I'm losing using all the tools that I gather from people like you and it is a beautiful thing now no it hasn't happened yet and who knows what will happen but that's where we are and it's a great thing so i just wanted to share that with everyone and me as a mom i'm pretty happy about it so yeah and we're going to do some nice boundaries we're going to have a hotel for uh, my daughter and her son and me and we're going to spend the days together and i'm fingers crossed and so that's a good thing. Yes. Yay. Congratulations. So to share that. <laughs> that is amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations, you two. And I'll, I know how special that is. And, you know, you said some, some really um, important things too, Linda. You know, you're using your resources, being available, reading, all, the, all these things that, that, you, that you and, you know, uh, Louise have done to get you where you are today. And that no is not necessarily no, it is never just final. It's just, you have to continue to surround yourself, listen, learn, contribute, and just keep pushing through. And exactly, that's what, and, and that's no right. one is static. No person on this earth is static. Right. They change all the time. So to, we should expect everyone in our, our circle of family and friends to be changing as well. So yeah, if someone's not ready now, they might be later. And I think keeping doors open is such, such a healthy thing. Keeping doors open, but setting boundaries so that you protect yourself. It's, it's, it's a wonderful mix. And I enjoy learning all that from this organization. So thank you. Couldn't have said it better than myself. I love that. Keeping the doors open, but making sure you have boundaries to protect yourself. Yeah. Yep. Beautiful. Beautifully said. There okay, is a, who's next? So there's a question in the chat. Um, said, even though you didn't have a reunion, uh, I hope you were able to get some info on your, like your medical history and that kind of stuff. Were you able to get that from your mother's or her family? So I received that in the non-identifying information. I got a little bit of that information, but, um, and I was in reunion with my brother who is three years older than me for a while. Um, and so I got a little bit of it from him. It wasn't my, my forethought. I should have done more before we um, kind of stopped communicating as much. And we stopped communicating because I decided to put up a boundary. He was really protecting and, um, just following what my mother, my biological mother wanted and which was that I stay a secret. And I didn't feel like that, that didn't feel right. Like every time I thought about them keeping me a secret and not wanting to share, just kind of put it a pit in my stomach. And so I chose to tell him that as long as he was going to go on her wishes and specifically not telling my nieces and nephews that I exist, um, that then I didn't want communication until he was ready to do that. And he basically has indicated that as long as she's alive and saying that, that that's what he'll, his stance will be. Um, so I didn't get enough information from them when I had the chance. And I'm sure I could ask him again if I wanted to. Uh, but the, my biological, um, my not identifying information, I'm sorry, had a lot of that medical stuff already in it. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry that you experienced that secondary rejection with your mother. I, you know, as moms, I just don't think that you and I quite can wrap our heads around that <laughs> I at, at no. all. I mean, how can you do that? I, every time I hear someone say that, I'm like, it breaks my heart. So. Yeah, I just, it, for me, she just hasn't done her work. She hasn't forgiven herself. She hasn't gotten over the whole situation. And um, I'm not angry. I feel sorry for her that she hasn't done the work that she needs to do to feel good about, about her and and kind of make it through. Um, I also know she is married to a, um, a former Maryland state senator now, and I'm sure that a lot of it is like fear of, of being embarrassed in the public or shame or him knowing any of this stuff. Um, from what my brother said, she is a lot of, a performative aspect is a, a large part of her life. She really um, cares about what people think and how she looks. And so it's just other things are a priority to, to her connection. But with the yeah. secondary rejection, I, I know that we say that we call it that. It doesn't feel like that to me because she doesn't know me to reject me. So I don't feel rejected as a person. I just feel like she hasn't done her work. If she got to know me and then was like, oh, I don't like you. I don't want anything to do with you. Then I'd be like, whoa, that kind of sucks. But yeah, no, I don't I don't feel like she has rejected me as a person because she still doesn't know me. We've never even had a conversation. I mean, she has no idea what she is missing out on because like of so fear <laughs> and shame. Yeah. I mean, you're an amazing person and she's, she's missing out. Your kids are awesome. She's missing out. It's unfortunate. Agreed. Agreed. Do we have anyone here this evening that is in reunion that has, uh, does see, I mean, any traditions that you have with both families that, or, um, you know, an event that's worked for you each year. Does somebody want to share something personal with their own families? I haven't experienced this myself, but I have three adopted brothers and my oldest adopted brother, when he connected with his birth mom, she started coming to our family gatherings. She came to Christmas and she came to Easter. And then when my parents died, she came to the funerals and, um, I was just, I was so happy for him. I was just happy for all of us that she was a part. And, and she and my mom really hit it off. And um, my brother's birth mother, um, her husband had recently died of, of after long-term dementia. My dad was going into dementia and they had this, they had this bond, these two moms, other than the son that, that they shared, they had this this other bond. And I was just so glad that, that she could come. I had kind of thought, wouldn't it be cool if all of us reconnected and all of us had our birth families coming, but you know, that's one of those things that would be a, kind of a miracle if that ever really happened. But it was just really neat that she felt comfortable and we all felt comfortable and we liked having her there. And it was a really cool thing. That is really cool. I hope to be there one day. <laughs> still doing my own work um, <laughs> for sure thanks Beth actually the um, I have connected with my sides but but my biologicals aren't that interested in meeting my adoptive you know if I had said hey come come and you know join us for this they they don't they don't really have an interest my mom had a real curiosity to meet any of of our biological family but but um, it's kind of like, yeah, we accept you. My experience has been, they say, yeah, we accept you, but we really don't care about your life before, which I think is, I think it's a little selfish on their part, possibly. I mean, they should at least have a little interest in, you know, in my life before I feel like, but anyhow, um, yeah, they don't have, they don't have much interest in that. So it's, it's something that you said earlier, everybody's at a different point in their journey. And there's work to be done every every single position, wherever you fit in. Absolutely. I had a similar experience with my um, adoptive mom and my biological family on my dad's side. My dad died in 1996, so I never met him. And he actually never knew that I was even conceived. Um, and, but um, he had seven kids who were all very open and welcoming to me. Um, 
I think it was probably 2018, 2019, my mother was in dementia. Um, their, their biological mom, their mom, his, his ex-wife, my dad's ex-wife um, also is in dementia, was in dementia at the time. So we had that connection as well. And they met my parents, my adoptive parents. So all of my siblings met my adoptive parents and we went to dinner together. And I remember feeling so anxious about the fact that she was in dementia and, you know, it kind of asked the same questions over and over again and was just kind of not the person that she was when I grew up and here I am introducing my siblings to her but because they had that shared experience that connection and that understanding and acceptance of who she was where she was just it just brought us closer together to have that bond as well so thank you for sharing I had forgotten about all of that that was amazing an amazing experience Peter. Yeah, I, I'm just sitting here listening to all this and I'm, I've probably got a different perspective about um, mothers and, and uh, adopted mothers meeting. And, uh, you know, due to my own circumstances of finding out five and a half years ago by DNA and the fact that the adopters were going to uh, take that to their grave, when my um, adopted mother found out that I was flying into state to visit my mother and siblings, uh, she wanted to come. And I didn't quite know how to say no, but my adopted sister stepped in and went, no, no, this is Peter's journey. He needs to do it alone. And to which the adopted mother said, but you said she had a stroke. What if she dies and I don't get to meet her? And I'm thinking, you were taking this to the grave. What if she died and I didn't get to meet her? I didn't get, my, get to meet my father for the same reason. So I didn't think she deserved to meet my mother. And I, you know, in, in hindsight, the reunion, it, it wouldn't have been right. My, my adopted sister was on... You know, I hate using the word grateful, but I was grateful that she stepped in, yeah, and and said that and uh, and sided with me, um, and, and was seeking my best interests. Yeah, so yeah, just different perspective, and yeah, you know, as as someone said, might have been Marcy said that uh, we all come from different perspectives and and through our own um, own journeys, and uh, yeah. Uh, I thought I'd just throw in <laughs> where I, I come from, not not trying to uh, yeah, influence anyone else, but uh, yeah, that's that's that was my story and my perspective on how it happened. Yeah, I appreciate that, and my my connection with my my biological family and my adoptive family didn't happen for a few years, about two years after my the, my original reunion with my biological family. I did that as well on my own and just felt like there have been so many decisions made on my behalf out of my control that this was the one place where I was centering myself and making myself the focus and it was just about me. So I, you know, perspectives are the same. It just took me a bit to kind of get to a place where I wanted them to meet. But it also took me to, uh, it took me to realize that my mom would not be able to even comprehend it much longer. So I just decided to do it. We haven't done it since though, but yeah, yeah. I understand that feeling. Okay, anybody else? It's really hard, y'all. It's hard. <laughs> I think not knowing is worse, but reunion is hard. Reunion is hard, and a competent therapist and support group like this is so helpful because there's so many questions and, and situations that come up that it's just impossible to process without talking to somebody that is really understands and like I'm really really picky about who I talk to because <laughs> I love what you said about doing the work because number one if they're not really involved in adoption you know they can kind of be um well, romanticized by the narrative and number two if they are in adoption but have not done 
the work and are still sort of in the narrative. I just, the more longer I'm in reunion, the less tolerance I have for it. <laughs> so I'm picky who I talk to. And I just, the most important thing is my relationship with my son. And that's what I just keep telling myself. All the other things that are challenging, they're challenging, but just keep remembering what's the most important. And uh, that's, that's helpful. And we've had a ton of blessing, a ton of challenge, and uh, they just go one day at a time. Yes, one day at a time for sure. And we learn something new all the time. I, I just in the last six months really came to the identity of me being someone who was a victim of, a, of adoption coercion as a birth mother. And that, I mean, I've been talking about these things for years and it was like one, one day I had a conversation with someone and was like, wait, all of those things that they did were to talk me out of what I really wanted to do. And had I had any information, I wouldn't have done it. And so that is a space that I'm still processing and understanding that that is where that, that resentment and jealousy comes from, from my mom, because all these years I said I made a decision when I was 17 years old, when I realized I did not make that decision at all. Yeah, right. I understand. That's a, that's a hard pill to swallow when we <laughs> kind of realize, wow. Well, I mean, I had no idea until reunion that in the baby scoop era, there were two to four million babies adopted that were largely due to coercion and shame and religious indoctrination and yeah. USA protocol and adoption. I just had no idea. So yeah, I'm, I hear you. It's, it's hard. I, um, I still have trouble um, blaming anyone beside myself though, because blame's not the right word, but yeah, I have some more digging to do in that, but um, part of it is just speaking out about it is one way I deal with it is to speak out about how it is a coercion. It's still today, coercive um, setup yeah. in America. Yes. Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I really appreciate what you've been saying, Dr. Hasbury, um, uh, about boundaries and buffers and time limits and body scanning and therapy. I think those are all really good things to be reminded of. And I wanted to say too, since you brought up um, having recently discovered that uh, or realized that you were coerced, um, I feel that way very often that, um, you know, I, I should, I want to tell my, um, my children that, uh, because I think that is an important part of my story. And um, there seems to be no interest in that. And I just wonder what your thoughts are about um, that. I mean, I guess I could do it generically and just write a book or uh, leave it for after I die and they can figure it out then. <laughs> Or um, I know with my son, I have sent him some information and he tells me that makes him even more uh, or even less interested. So I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, absolutely. So I definitely have some like pretty strong thoughts about kind of sharing stories with um, my son. And the thing I always ask myself is, is it for my benefit or for his? And usually the answer is it's for mine and not his. And so I don't share. So I find other people to talk to um, because when it's for his benefit, he's going to ask me when he wants to know he's going to ask me. And so me kind of coming up with this like, aha, a few six months ago that like all of these happen, all of these things happen. I wanted to tell him, I want to share. I want you to be like, don't you understand? But that's not for me, for him. That's for me. Um, when he he's working through the process on his own, he's working through all of the feelings that he has about being abandoned and lost and all of the things that I presumably did to him and whether or not 
I feel coerced or not, it doesn't change the impact on him. And the impact is that he was abandoned and he has lost. And so me telling him the reasons why I did this thing isn't for his benefit, it would be for mine. And so I don't. Well, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> I mean, Hard. that's really, that's really <laughs> an evolved, uh, in my opinion, that's a very evolved, um, position to take. And, and, uh, I'm, I have not gotten there yet. I, I, but I really appreciate you saying that because I, I, I think you're, you're right. And that is, um, that is where I've been coming from is that I want him to understand about why uh, or how it happened. And, um, and he's really not interested. Yeah. And I see now that you're saying, you know, it's, it's because the impact on him, I mean, I, I've never discounted the impact it had on him. And I've usually mentioned it when I've come up with bits about my own story, but um, but that that had what he sees is I'm trying to justify something that hurt him, yeah. and so I get it. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that. That's very clear. Thank you. It's not easy though. <laughs> Hey, anybody else who's next? While Jennifer, we're waiting, I want yeah. to uh, let you know, we are doing a drawing tonight. Everybody's yeah. name is entered in here. Um, so stick around, don't leave because Marcy will let us know when and I will draw somebody's name. And Marcy, what are what are they up to win? Uh, a $25 Amazon gift card if your name is pulled tonight from courtesy of NAP. And that and most of us time haven't finished that. shopping. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll help you out a little bit there. <laughs> Peter, did you have another question or comment? Yeah, I just just pick up what um Abby said then. She mentioned um that her son wasn't interested in uh, hearing about her her forced being being forced and this often comes up when we're advocating here that we get pushed into this box of a uh, forced adoption and you know that was in the past and doesn't matter in the numerous um submissions i've made to inquiries and that and some of them have been focused on forced adoption i've stated that my trauma is not be, being forced. Oh, sorry, I hope you do the background noise here. My my my, uh, <laughs> my 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 trauma is not being that my mother was forced. That is my mother's trauma. My trauma is being adopted. Yep. And I try and you know push that narrative that you know, to, to, to dispel the narrative that this is all in the past and yeah you know, yeah. You know, um, but, you know, which I try to do, but I, yeah, that's, that's not um, denouncing at all the trauma that my mother went through, through, you know, our forced adoption era. And, you know, it was horrific what, what was done to them. And, uh, but, you know, the coercion and to, you know, the other mothers who, you know, you know, were drugged and tied to beds and all that stuff, you know, it's all horrific. But, yeah, it's... From an adoptee's point of view, it's yeah, adoption is my primary thing. You know, when I yeah, you know, I think about anything, it's I was adopted. I was I was yeah, I lost my identity. I, my mother lost a a child, but I lost a family. Yeah. So yeah, no, just wanted. Very well said. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Susan. Oh, hi. I've been having some trouble with my uh, video, my computer this evening. Can everybody hear me? Yes. 
Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah, I wanted to address the issue. Um, I was part of a large family, divorced parents, and then step siblings, you know, from different combinations of marriages and adoptive parents and step parents. Um, I found that very difficult. You know, I felt like odd child out. Um, I know you mentioned you also have a different background than your adoptive family. Mine actually, after I found my uh, biological families on both sides, I ended up basically being like a perfect match, which was, you know, kind of two different types of backgrounds. But anyway, I was really a, an exact match for this adoptive family. But I found it very hard. You know, I was the only one who had been born in another city and had like this whole mystery background. I didn't share their medical history, um, you know, looking different. So could you, I'd really be interested in hearing, you know, how that affected you a bit more? Sure, yeah, so definitely, even beyond being a completely different race, there were things that I remember growing up as a child that made me just feel so different. Um, when I was probably around five or six, my mother put us all in piano lessons and the piano teacher um, taught us all to play. And I was probably the, I, no, not probably. I was, although though I was the youngest, I definitely picked it up faster than my siblings. And at one point the piano player realized that I couldn't read music at all. I was just waiting for her to play the piece and leave so that I could then teach myself by ear. And she told me that I was the one who was unteachable and they stopped my lessons. And I remember just being like, what in the world? Like, you know, I love this thing and I, I don't do it. And when I found my biological family and I found out that my father was in a, a, a singing group and my two of my uncles were very famous singers in, um, in France. And my um, cousin was um, in the Soft Tones, which is a, a group from the 70s. Um, it made all the kind of sense of like, okay, this, these are the things that weren't connecting. So even beyond being a different race and having different culture and different foods and things that were taking from me from being adopted, there were also these inherent things. My personality is very, very low key. How you see me now is kind of how I am all the time. Like, this is me excited, this is me mad, this is me, everything is just like this. Um, and my family was very excitable and I often kind of just didn't feel comfortable when they were getting really loud around the table and talking because I just couldn't get a word in ed edgewise because I was just being this. Um, so there were a lot of things that just didn't connect, but I think that the hardest definitely was the, the racial differences because at some point around middle school, I really wanted to find and connect to the black community. And so I was listening to black music and watching black movies and started to change the way I talked and the way I spoke and the way I dress. And I definitely had the opposite situation that most people, African-Americans do where I didn't go into work and become kind of a different version of myself. I was at home and I was a different version of myself. And when I was with my friends and within the black community was the first time that I felt a lot like myself. Um, and, and that was really, really hard growing up, just feeling so kind of different and out of place and not exactly knowing what it was. Um, and when I found my biological family, it was just kind of like a, a wusa. Like it was just like, okay, these are these people are these are people who I understand and understand me. Although it, it wasn't all the the nature part because there are parts of my identity. Um, my parents and I traveled all over the world growing up, and my biological family was born and raised in Maryland and really didn't leave. And so there are parts of me like that that they don't understand about me. Um, my need to continue to get degrees. My adopted father has a PhD. My mother has a master's degree. Like I followed them in that education world and my biological family doesn't kind of quite get that about me as well. So there are things that are, and they also are very religious in my family when my adoptive family was not. So there are things that really connect me to my biological family and there are things that really connect me to my adoptive family and then vice versa. There are things that don't fit right in, in both either. And so it, it, that even that alone is othering to not have one that really is home. Um, so I think that I, I really formed that with my kids and my husband and that has been my home.
did you feel very connected um, to your adoptive siblings? Did they accept you fully? Yes, absolutely. I did and do and still do feel very, very connected to them. We have a shared growing up experience and, and went through the life of our of all the craziness of our parents together and, and just all of the moving and all the things. So I do still feel very connected to them and have a really good relationship to them. But there is a part of me that they just will probably will just never really know and understand because it's a part that I've kept kind of separate in, in my black identity. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Susan. Anybody else have any questions or comments for Dr. Abby before we begin the wrap up tonight? I was just thinking at what she said um, was something I think a lot of us as adoptees feel that the other, we don't fully belong anywhere. I have what's left of my adoptive family. Most of them have passed, but you know, these are the people that I grew up with, although most of them are a decade older than me at the least. Um, but these are the people you have the shared experience with, but you don't have the genetic mirroring. You don't have that draw to these people I fit with. And then you have the people that you fit with. But for me, I miss 50 years with my sisters, with my mother, with my father. And even though I have all of that shared experiences growing up together, that really is very important. So you are kind of in this no man's land of like, I missed all this. I want to fit in here. I don't understand what they're talking about, something that happened 30 years ago. And when you've got your other family and it's, it's just, it's a very weird Kind of no man's land that we exist in. Yeah. And the holidays amplify that. Unless you're insane like me and say no one can come but my family. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce? Yeah, that's um that's one of the things that has been been uh, plaguing me too. What, what Jennifer just um, was talking about, um, and like it's been really, you know, clear to me over you know over the past uh, a couple of years that I I just never belonged in my adoptive family. But I at the same point at the same time I I don't feel a sense of belonging in my in my birth family either. Um, you know, that's I think that's shifting. Um, now as I continue to do, you know, my work. Um, but what I, you know, what I tell people is that, you know, where I feel the most sense of belonging is with other adoptees and, and moms. You know, that's because that's where I feel a sense of, of being understood um, and being seen. Um, and, and therefore that's, you know, that's where I feel, you know, that I, I belong. Um, I think that, that sense of belonging is leading me to a, a deeper sense of belonging in my in my birth family. Um, unfortunately, my mom died. Um, actually, I'm coming up on the on the 20th anniversary of her of her passing, and um, and I had only known her a, a couple of years, and she died, you know, tragically and prematurely in a in a house fire. Um, and so I, you know, I haven't had the opportunity to like spend you know, holiday times with my birth family or even getting to know my birth family. <clears throat> and I, and, and just listening to everybody share tonight, it's, it's helping me kind of reflect on the complicated relationship that I had with my adoptive family around the holidays. And, you know, with respect to boundaries and things like that, like even like way back in my 20s, as I was, there was, you know, some evidence that I was coming out of the fog. And it became clear to me at, at some point that I, I just could not go home for the holidays anymore. And I, you know, I chalked it up to, you know, I tried to explain it away as well. I'm, I'm just not comfortable being around my adoptive dad. He wasn't entirely a safe person for me to be around. But there was this other element, I think, of really feeling like a fish out of water when I was there. Um, for me, it helped. I was, you know, 1,500 miles away. So 
you know, there was a lot of travel that would be involved in, in, in having to, to go home. Um, and <clears throat> so it's sort of like by default, I set a boundary, but it wasn't from a place of, of real consciousness or anything. It was just sort of out of desperation <laughs> um, that I, <laughs> I just needed to emotionally survive it. Um, and then, you know, with my, with my mom passing, um, you know, like I said, I, I never got a chance to develop a relationship there or build traditions around, around holidays there. But, you know, she, she does have a twin sister um, who I've been in, in, in contact with ever since. Uh, I mean, you know, as, as soon as I met my mom a couple of years before she died, I was, you know, I, I was getting to know my, my aunt as well. And we've had this really long, you know, email relationship that has been wonderful, but that's as far as I guess for me, it felt comfortable taking it, you know, for whatever reason. And then just this past summer, I, I realized like, why am I not taking this relationship further? Um, and I did, I, I sort of pivoted and it's like, and we've been, you know, talking on the phone quite a bit and I'm really looking forward to finally having a holiday where I can call and talk to somebody, you know, in my, in my birth family. Um, and that's going to be really exciting. Um, and the interesting thing about, I was thinking also, as people were sharing with regard to my, my birth mom, um, you know, the couple of years that I did know her, it was really great around the holidays because she loved to give gifts. And it was so interesting. And I thought that everything that she gave me was just spot on. It was just, it's like, she just knew me. And I remember feeling really gratified, you know, by that, but it brings me to my question, which is one of the things that I, I have not been able to figure out or resolve in myself is, is that, and I think, you know, my adoption issues, you know, tie into this is that I have an incredible amount of difficulty in figuring out what to give people. And like in the beginning of the meeting, I, you know, I put in the chat um, at Marcy's prompting, you know, that I haven't even started my shopping yet because it's just, it just feels like it's too big of a, a, a thing to try to figure out um, what, what people, you know, including my immediate family are, are going to appreciate. And I, I think it has to do with connection like I always felt disconnected in my adoptive family. Therefore, I felt pretty disconnected from myself. And my work is, is leading me to a deeper connection with myself, but I still feel disconnected from even the people that are closest to me, you know, my wife and my daughters. And, um, and I think there's a risk in buying a gift that misses the mark. And, you know, and then, there would be evidence there that there's that I'm I'm not really connected to them and then feeling shame about about that. And I'm, you know, there's some part of me I think that's just trying to avoid that. But but I don't know for sure. So I'm just wondering if you have any perspective on that or if you've heard that from other adoptees as well. Yeah, I actually have heard that. And it's actually came from one of my clients who said that they weren't ever sure like what to do or how to connect in, in that gift giving way. Um, and we talked through it in a way of kind of like, well, what, you know, what would you be comfortable with and, and what kind of um, experience do you want them to have? I think was the word, it, well, that was the exact word that I used. And he then kind of grabbed onto that experience and decided that he wanted to give people experiences. So he gave them like gift certificates to go one of one of his nieces loved horses. And so he got her like a horseback riding lesson and he decided to go with experiences experiences because that was something that he knew that he could give to their lives and that he was connected in what they were doing and when they were doing that thing hopefully they were thinking about him um, because giving a tangible kind of thing he just couldn't even figure out what what that would look like or, or how to do it mm -hmm. um, so no you're not at all alone mm -hmm. um, and I guess I'd put back on you the same question is like what what kind of experience had when they received the gift from you well I'm sorry what kind of experience do you want them to have when they receive the gift from you? Oh, yeah, I just I want to give something that has meaning and I want to give something that is going to be useful. Um, Sometimes those two uh, things don't go together. So like which right. one of those is more important? 
Yeah, and maybe I'm I'm maybe I'm expecting too much. You know, it, it's just I don't want to. I I just don't want the gift to be a waste. Um, you know, or to be evidenced that there's you know not a strong connection. Um, but I like the idea of of giving something you know that is an experience. And maybe I can I can ponder that. I've got a you know a, another a week. <laughs> No pressure. No pressure at all, right? <laughs> no. uh, thank, thanks very much. Absolutely. Thank you, Bruce. Okay, as we're winding down, got time for one more question or comment before we do the drawing. Anybody? Okay. Okay. Well, well, Dr. Abby, we'd like to thank you for coming on this evening and being our spotlight guest for our holiday special. And we always give you our round, our signature round of applause. Everybody get their hands up for Dr. Abby. <laughs> thank, thank you, you so much for having me. me. We appreciate it. So um, I think Jennifer has the, yeah, Jennifer's got the little basket ready. We're going to go ahead and pull out our, our holiday winner tonight. I'm mixing them up good. I can't good hear time. you. Oh, there okay. You can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. I'm mixing them up good. Let me get one here. Whoops. Okay. Okay. See if you can read that. It, that is, I think it's Denise. Which way? Who is that? Is that Denise? She's still here? Let me see. Denise. Miss Denise. Yeah. She's still here. Denise, are you here? Looks like she is, but she's on mute. Denise. She says, I'm here. <laughs> okay. You won. Merry okay. Christmas. Happy New Year. There you go. So we need to get some contact information from you. Uh, well, we've got her email, correct? So obviously yeah. we would just send her the, okay. So we're cool. Well, congratulations. We have a winner. Okay. Well, that's a wrap from us here at NAP. Uh, just to let you know, this is the, our last show of the, of the year. Uh, we'll be back on the first Friday of the month on January the 6th. Am I frozen again? No, nope, you're not frozen. Okay. We'll be back on January the 6th. Uh, we hope everyone has a happy holiday season. We, if you have any, any, any questions about the upcoming summit or um, if you have a suggestion for a happy hour guest, please feel to reach out to myself, Jennifer or Beth. We really appreciate all, all of you. I mean, we're, you know, again, we're here. What is it going on three years now? And four. we're starting for year four, getting ready to start year four. Is it really four? Where have I been? Oh my gosh. Oh, I forgot. I know where I've been. Anyway, we, we won't go there. Um, but uh, but we appreciate all of you. And it's it's because of you that we're still here. And we appreciate all the support. You know, we get emails and comments and phone calls and text messages all the time from you guys. And we love each and every one of you. It just means so much. And some of you we've really gotten close to this year. And we hope you'll stay with us and you'll be back in uh, 2023. And um, Jennifer, Beth, you have anything to say? Well, there was just a question about Amy Seek. Um, she is going to be on January 12th at 6 p.m. Eastern time um, on, on uh, Amber's program, the birth, uh, first families journeying together. So yes, for she will be on there. You can register on Eventbrite for that. Anybody who wants to see Amy Seek. Mm -hmm. And then our first show for next year is a uh, legislative update, what all took place this year and looking forward to next year. What are the opportunities? What are the challenges? And yeah, we want to, we want to do a deep dive on that and kick the, the new year off with what took place in 2022, what went right, what went wrong and what we have on the horizon. So we'll be, we'll be talking legislation to open up the new year. So um, again, that's, that's everything for me, guys. I really appreciate you coming on tonight and everybody have a happy holiday. Happy holidays. <laughs>